Boys, what's good? Welcome to day three of 30 Teams 30 Days, my series this September previewing every team for the 2024 NBA season, going through their players, going through the coach, you know, the roster, the lineup, just everything about the team, what to expect from them this season, a detailed breakdown. And this Nets one might be one of my most detailed breakdowns because I want to talk about so many players individually on this team because this is a team that's built on upside and the Brooklyn Nets are the most unpredictable team in the entire NBA because they have so many guys with so high upside, but also that could not hit. So it leads to a very high ceiling and a very low floor. And I'm going to get into that. I'm going to talk about all of it. But before I do, think about subscribing. It's free, it's easy, and if you don't like the content, you know, always unsubscribe later, that's fine. But without further ado, let's just get right into it. Starting off with last season, because to understand what's up for this season, we need some context. So in 2023, the Nets finished 45 and 37, good enough for sixth place in the Eastern Conference, avoiding the play-in. They had two All-Stars in Kevin Durant and Kyrie Irving, and had three 20-point-per-game scores in total for the season, with KD, Kyrie and then Mikel Bridges. They look like a contender in the middle of last season, especially around like December and early January, winning 15 out of 16 games, including 12 straight at one point. They traded stars KD and Kyrie at the deadline and ended that era of Nets basketball that started in, I believe, 2020. They lost in 2019 to the Raptors and then KD joined after that. So they come in 2020 and it, it didn't go as they planned and they moved on. Both guys asked out and eventually they granted them their requests. Mikel Bridges blossomed into a star level player. He was acquired in the KD trade and went from a guy who was like a 15, 16, 17 point per game score to a 26, 27 point per game score. Really blossomed into a very efficient lead guy in Brooklyn down the stretch of last season. Uh, they did lose in the first round to the Sixers uh, going down in I believe five games. Uh, but then we talk about the 2023 offseason. Uh, in terms of guys they lost, it's kind of like ro like middle of the road rotational guys. They lost Yuta the Shooter, Yuta Watanabe, Joe Harris, Seth Curry, and Patty Mills. That is a lot of shooting to lose. I'll say that right now. They did lose a lot of good and talented shooters. But they added Lonnie Walker, who was great with the Lakers last year. Added Dennis Smith Jr., who had a bounce back year. Added Harry Giles, who a lot of people are really intrigued by. And then they drafted three guys, and Derek Whitehead. Noah Clowney and Jalen Wilson. Uh, well, let's talk about the guys because there are a lot of guys with high upside. If these players hit, it could take Brooklyn from mid to contenders, which is super huge. And I think that they really have that level of upside because of the guys I'm going to list. Starting off with Mikhail Bridges, I'm going to talk about him first because I think he's like the most sure of the guys. I feel pretty confident Mikhail is a star level player. I like what I saw down the stretch of last year. I've liked what I've seen with Team USA. I think Mikhail is a number one guy going forward and I think his upside is pretty much reached I think he's gonna be that and I think he's gonna be an all-star going forward so I feel very confident with Mikel to me, he's the new franchise player, was acquired in the KD trade, like I said. Two-way stud, a runner-up and defensive player of the year, I believe in 2022. Uh, just 27 years old, is just hitting his prime. 26 points per game with Brooklyn last year, four and a half, excuse me, four and a half rebounds and about three assists. Really great job for him with Brooklyn. Was just phenomenal and pretty good with them in the playoffs as well. 38% from three on pretty high volume, as well as one steal per game. Went from a good starter, a guy who's like probably your third or fourth best player to star player the best guy on the team i saw bleacher report ranked him as the 25th best player in the entire league which implies he'd be the best player on like 10 different teams because a lot of teams in there have like two guys so Mikel being at 25 is a sign of a lot of respect a lot of people thought it was a little high uh, just because we've only seen it in glimpses like it wasn't a a super huge sample size it was just the latter half of last season so people want to see it for a full season but i think I think he's good. I think he's great. I think he's going to be an all-star next season. That's the question. Will he be an all-star in the East? I think he will. I saw someone ask me once, like, who's he replacing? Uh, KD. KD left the conference. Mikel can slip right in and be an all-star in his spot. Then we have to look at Ben Simmons, probably the most polarizing player on the team. One of the most polarizing players in the league. Gets a lot of hate on him, and a lot of it is kind of warranted, uh, but he has been going through a lot of injuries. Many have given up on him, but he's said to be 100% healthy again 
again for the first time since like 2021, his last healthy season with Philadelphia, which he was an all-star that season. He's a three-time all-star and four seasons with Philadelphia, rookie of the year and defensive player of the year runner up in 2021. Is 27 years old, still relatively young, again just hitting the start of his prime, but last year was bad. Six points per game, six rebounds, and six assists, but he did have an injured back. People don't want to admit that. Ben Simmons was hurt last year and that's why he played like he did, but even during a bad season where he was injured, he was still a good defender, which I think is a really good sign of him being at least a valuable impact player moving forward. But the biggest question will be, are his best days behind him? I'd lean towards no. I don't know if he'll return to what we saw in Philadelphia. Philadelphia, but if he can get kind of close, it'll completely change this team. If it turns out it was just an injury, like the back thing was really this huge problem last year, and Ben Simmons is back to all-star Ben next season, the Nets are a completely different team. He would be arguably the best player because of everything he does, and he would take them to the next level. If Mikel is what he was last year and Ben Simmons is back to all-star Ben, the Nets can be legitimate contenders in the East because of the supporting cast. And that's before we even get to all the other high upside guys. But Ben Simmons is the guy that can completely change this team and is what makes them uh, unpredictable more than anyone else. Uh, then we have to look at Nick Claxton, who I really like as well. He was a near all-star last year. I'm going to die on that hill. I, I am. I think he was an all-star level talent last season, at least when they were choosing for the all-star game. Because when they were winning with Kyrie, KD missed a lot of it. Clax was their second best player on like, the best team in the East at that point, uh, just based on how they were playing. And Clax was a huge part of that. A super efficient, great rebounder, elite rim protector. He plays well with other stars. He played really well with Kyrie. It's just 20 four years old older than i'm um, younger than the other two guys i just mentioned 12.6 points per game last year 9.2 rebounds and two assists pretty solid for a center who's like a, a rim runner by the way to get two assists per game 71 percent from the field and two and a half blocks per game it didn't get talked about as much because the nets kind of dropped off after the stars left a little but he was in the defensive player of the year conversation last year as well and if you're that good defensively and an efficient offensive player to me that's an all-star level in impact. Uh, just like we saw Rudy Gobert make some all-star games, I think Nick Claxton has the upside to be that level of player, like a Utah Rudy Gobert. I love Nick Claxton. I think he's a great player. He did have a slight production slip after Kyrie left, but if Ben Simmons is back to his passing ways, it could help bring up Claxton. He did play with Embiid, who is a you know dominant interior presence, so it's not going to hurt Claxton if Simmons is back to what he used to be. Uh, then we have to talk about Cam Thomas, one of my favorite players in the league. I've been behind him from the start. He's one of the most talented scorers I've ever seen. He's an absurdly talented scorer, the youngest player in NBA history with three straight 40-point games. Uh, they won one of them, by the way. There's some narrative going around that they lost all of them. That's just not true. They did beat the Wizards. Uh, but had four 40-point games last season in pretty limited opportunity. Like, when he gets out there, he's going to be a bucket. He's just 21 years old. is still very young. Uh, and 10.6 points per game last year on 44-38-87 splits. Not the best uh, efficiency you'll ever see, but there's a narrative around him like he's some super inefficient player. 38% from three is pretty solid. 44 is a little below average, I believe. But 38 is above average. And the, the free throws are also above average. So if he's taking good, smart shots, he's an efficient player. His stats when he gets greater than 30 minutes is 25 points per game, pretty much he round up, but he's only been given that many minutes in 15 games for his two-year career. Uh, in his stats in starts, he started six games, and in those games, he's averaged 33 points per game, basically five rebounds and two and a half assists on 45% from three. When given the opportunity to be the guy, he's been efficient, and he's been very good at it. I know the defense is somewhat lacking i know the passing is somewhat lacking but you have to give this guy a shot he's too talented not to give him a shot cam thomas if you know on a team like the rockets where jalen green was there or the pistons where cade was if he's getting their touches cade is view cam sorry cam thomas is viewed as one of the best young players in the league he just is because he's so gifted as a scorer 
It's pretty clear that head coach Jacques Vaughn doesn't necessarily like him because he wouldn't really give him a real chance. Going down the stretch last season, he was basically uh, not even in the rotation, which is insane. He's just too good for that. He could easily average 20 next season if given an opportunity. So the upside with Cam uh, kind of relies more on opportunity than it does on him reaching it because if he's out there, he's going to be great. Uh, Cam Johnson, again, another guy who may many wouldn't think of as an upside guy, but he does have some upside because he's an elite 3 and D forward right now. I don't think that's arguable. He's basically the best 3 and D uh, non-star in the league because he is a great floor spacer, over 40% for a lot of his career, and a very good defender. He's a player that every team who's a good team would want. Spaces the floor, 27 years old, again, just hitting his prime. With Brooklyn last season, 17 points per game, up from his average of 11. His career average is 11 points per game, but when he got to Brooklyn, it was 17 points per game. Five rebounds bounce and two assists, 40% from three like I said, but can he be the 17 point per game score he was with Brooklyn again because he was just a better player. He wasn't a star, but he was a very good, very high level starter. And is he more than just a shooter? I'd say he is. I think there's some level of self-creation there, but even if he's not, even if he's just a shooter and a defender, he's a very valuable player. Uh, then we talk about Lonnie Walker, a proven scoring guard uh, with the Spurs and with the Lakers. Was the Lakers third best player before injury? I'm a Lakers guy watch a lot of Lakers uh, in the early parts of the season the first couple months Lonnie Walker behind LeBron and AD was the third best player on that team uh, he's a very good player, a very gifted player. He just struggled with injuries uh, throughout the course of the last regular season. But he won LA a playoff game almost single-handedly, scoring 15 points in the fourth quarter against the Warriors to steal a game. Uh, just an amazing performance. Just 24 years old, one of the youngest guys I've mentioned so far. 12 points per game and two rebounds, 37% from three last year. I believe his best shooting three-point year so far, and just uh, pretty efficient. Like, that's solid. You're going to take that. But can he fulfill his potential? Because if he's at his best he's easily a 15 point per game score like I don't even think that's debatable he's very talented and a crazy athlete so is Brooklyn gonna unleash him do they have too many guys we'll see but Lottie Walker has a lot of upside as a score and is not a bad defender uh, then we can talk about Dennis Smith Jr., who they also signed. Former lottery pick to Dallas the year before Lucas. I believe 2017, I think that was. Uh, lost confidence after being replaced by Luka. They draft him, and uh, DSJ just wasn't the same. They didn't fit together. They traded him, and then wasn't the same after that. Was almost chased, uh, he almost chased after the NFL. Almost gave up on basketball together and chased after football. But got a call from Charlotte and decided to give it a shot. And he had a revival season with Charlotte in 2022, 2020. Arguably his best season yet because he started playing defensively. Before he hadn't given effort defensively, last season he did. He's just 25 and averaged 9 points, 5 assists, and 1.5 and steals per game last season and was an all defense candidate at the guard spot. Was one of the, you know, kind of 5 to 10 best defensive guards in the league last year, which nobody would have expected. He was so good defensively. And I think that makes him extremely valuable because he has the offensive talent. We've seen it and he has proven he can be a great backup guard so Dennis Smith Jr. could be a very high level player for Brooklyn. Then we can talk about Harry Giles, a former top recruit in his high school class. They just signed him, it was either uh, yesterday or the day before. Has been very limited by injuries both at Duke and once he hit the league. Hasn't played since 2021 but has worked very hard to get back and there are apparently multiple teams wanting to sign him so there could be something there. Still just 25, his best season he averaged 7 points, 4 rebounds, and shot 55 percent from the field he could very easily be nothing maybe he doesn't even really play for Brooklyn but the upside is there to be a good backup forward and be an important piece of the rotation uh, then let's talk about the rookies because there are three first year guys who I think could be early contributors for Brooklyn a little more than people expect first I want to talk about Jalen Wilson who I think is one of the steals of this draft class was the 51st overall pick late second rounder in an absolute star in college but people question how he'd kind of transfer to the NBA because he was like the go-to guy in college and people weren't sure how he could work in the league because he wasn't going to be the go-to scorer type. Uh, but 22 years old, 6'8", 215, in a really decorated college career. Uh, NCAA champion in... 
2022, not this past year, but the year before. Uh, Consensus All-American last year, 2023 Big 12 Player of the Year. Uh, Made the All-Summer League team as well, very impressive at the Summer League. Averaged 18, 8, uh, 3 assists, and 1.6 stocks, which is steals and blocks. And it's just one of the steals of the draft. I think Jalen Wilson could be a very good player for Brooklyn, but we'll see how much opportunity he gets in year one. Uh, Then you have Dariq Whitehead. Sorry, I'll go back a slide here. Uh, we're a little far ahead. We're skipping ahead. We'll talk about Dariq Whitehead, 26, 22nd overall pick, and could be a very good two-way wing. Was the number two recruit in 2022, suffered with injuries at Duke, 19 years old, one of the younger players in the class, is an elite shooter and wing defender, but injuries cause him to fall. But at Duke, just averaging eight points, but did shoot 43% from three, so could come off the bench and hit some threes for Brooklyn in year one. Then we talk about Noah Clowney, who's going to be vying for the backup center spot. One of the youngest players in the class, also 19, turned it pretty recently, was the sidekick to Brandon Miller at Alabama, their second best player. 10 points per game and 8 rebounds, projects as a good lob finisher and a solid interior defender. Is very athletic, one of the best natural athletes in his draft class, and either him or Daron Sharp will become the long-term backup for Claxton. Uh, one of these two guys will emerge as a very solid backup center. Uh, Then we have to talk about the unpredictable coach, because I talked about how Ben Simmons is very unpredictable, but so is Jacques Vaughn. 776 games as a player, so a lot of experience there, but just 4.5 points per game was a role player in his career. That's fine. That doesn't really affect his coaching. Uh, 48 years old and for his career, has a record of 108 and 193 for a winning percentage of 36. Not very good. Uh, Has had some some short stints with the Magic and the Nets, uh, coached them on an inner basis uh, before uh, last season as well so has been with the Nets for a while coached them a couple of times and had I believe three full seasons with the Magic was one time coach of the month December of last season after uh, taking over for Steve Nash and doing a very good job Uh, that was when they won 15 out of 16 Uh, Seemed all right with KD and Kyrie and got 7th in Coach of the Year voting last year, which is solid. Was a a solid coach, but his handling of Thomas is what has really irked me. Immediately bench Cam Thomas after scoring 40 in 3 straight games. It was technically the game right after that uh, because he scored 40 in 3 straight. Then the next game he had like 30 uh, with like a 20 point second half or something. Uh, And then after that, he benched him. He said no homo in an interview and then got benched. So I I don't really like how he's handled Cam. Hasn't really given him a chance. He seems to have something against young guys or guys who have kind of flashes and spurts, which is a lot of this team. So it'll be interesting if he's really the guy to help Brooklyn get where they need to go. Uh, Projected lineup wise, this could change very easily depending on if guys really overperform or underperform. Uh, But I think the starting lineup will probably be Ben Simmons, Mikel Bridges, Dorian Finney-Smith, great 3 and D guy didn't talk about in detail. Uh, Cam Johnson and Nick Claxton with the second unit being Dinwiddie, Walker, O'Neal, Wilson, and Sharp. And then Smith, Cam Thomas, Derek Whitehead, Darius Baisley, who they signed, and Noah Clowney as your 15 guys. This is a lot of guys. I don't usually list this many. I think they have a lot of guys who could be important for them. Trenton Watford as well, I didn't mention. Uh, And then what to expect in 2024. So what are the Nets going to be next season? I think on the low end, if Simmons is bad again, if... Cam Thomas doesn't get minutes if Bridges takes like a slight step back, although I think he is what he is now. I think he's a star. Uh, they could miss the plan. Uh, like they, if the, the stars don't hit, then they don't have a ton of talent because there's a lot of talent that can be reached, but if it isn't reached all of a sudden, it's not great because there isn't a talent, a bunch of talent that's already set in stone. It's kind of waiting to be reached. So a lot of that could result in uh, not being an awful team, like not the worst team in the East or anything, but they could finish like 11th or 12th. But on the high end, I think they could finish top six in the Eastern Conference and compete for home court advantage in the playoffs. So to be top four, I think if uh, Simmons and Bridges hit both their levels, they could be like really good and like surprisingly good next season. Uh, at least one of Simmons, Thomas, and Lonnie Walker will really take a big step. I feel confident at least one of those three will take a step. Uh, probably two will. Uh, at least one, like I said, I feel confident. But it feels unlikely all three, like the Nets really have the room for all three to take big steps. Uh, Simmons and Thomas would be my thoughts, but Walker could be the guy instead of Cam this year, who see, like I guess we'll see. Uh, but 
it, it feels like it'd be hard for all three to take a jump like that but I expect at least one all-star in Bridges uh, I think he's at that point in his career uh, and if he returns to form Simmons could be one as well will be extremely fun to watch because of all the guys who possess really high ceilings so it could be a different guy in every night who's performing at this top level this is a team built on upside so many guys have upside they can be a near contender if they unlock it they're stacked with shooting and defense and potential stars so you have basically everything you could ask for for a really good core i think this is a great core a really good setup if it's developed properly and the nets are quietly one of the most dangerous teams in the league if you have all-star ben all-star bridges and cam thomas being the third guy putting up like 20 a game claxton's being rudy gobert light this team will be really dangerous uh but that's it for me thanks for watching have a good rest of your day think about subscribing but that's it we're on the road to 10k see ya